Welcome inside the WOSN studios. It's time for another week of Press Row. We're joined by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Guys, we've got a lot to catch up on, including some high school baseball and the Western Buckeye League off to a fantastic start on the diamond. Defiance, still looking at them as the favorite. They had a big win over Bath, who was previously unbeaten on Tuesday. Do you like Defiance in the Western Buckeye League, or are you taking the field? Well, I mean, I think you always, you always take the field if you get that <laughs> bet. But uh, obviously, Defiance is always their interesting way. They won against Bath the other night. Uh, all the runs score via errors as uh, Smitty throws a no-hitter, and even Defiance can't get a hit to score a run. They get it on a safety squeeze that turns into two runs. So uh, I think, you know, when you look at Wapakoneta still hanging out there undefeated as of this taping, uh, I, I would go with Defiance as the favorite, but if I get to play the odds, I'll take the field because there's some good teams out there yet, and they still have to go through all that. I, I'm going to take Defiance, and here's why. They didn't win the title last year. Chip on the shoulder, maybe, so to speak, this year, but still the WBL is just so loaded, uh, you know, baseball-wise, and it's become this trend the last three, four years where, you know, Wapakoneta has been right there. We've seen Salina, St. Mary's and the like there and programs there that can just jump up and bite you at any given moment on a week, on a weeknight or on a weekend. But I, I just think this Defiance team right now is on a mission. You know, you mentioned Salina. Don't forget you got Seth Lonsway for Salina. He's going to pitch for Ohio State next season. I, I, I am going to go with Defiance. I think getting that win over Bath, that was a big win for Defiance. Yes, they still got to have to go through Wapakoneta. They seemingly always find a way to beat Wapak, though. But I think it'll come down to, to Wapak and Defiance, although Salina's going to be lurking out there. And don't count Bath out of this completely yet. You know, it's interesting. We talk about dynasties and are they good for the sport or for their league. Sometimes, you know, the, the UConn women's basketball thing is, is one of those you talk about. But give kudos to the WBL for stepping up to the Defiance level. You know, they were so dominant for so long. But all of a sudden, it seems like every year there's – a few really good teams in the WBL this year, maybe as many as five or six. So I, I think other teams have taken it upon themselves. Hey, we got to get better if we're going to even be in Defiance's league. So the, the other thing you got to look at is Bath, Wapak, Defiance all go to the same district. Yep. So only one team's going to regional. Last year, Aaron correctly said Defiance did not win the league, but they did win the state title. Yes. So. Yeah, there's a lot of baseball yet to go. Including beating Defiance, or beating Bath, rather, right, right, in a right. regional semi game that Matt and I yeah, called that's what at I was Carter Park. Say, the last two times that Bath has played Defiance, it's been really close and really good games. Mm -hmm. and you guys already mentioned Lonsway and Smitty and you know Andrew Renner for Bath. There, there's a lot of good pitchers in the WBL, which should only help it going forward. In terms of the question, I'm taking the field because I think we're going to have a shared title. I see Defiance picking up one L, and then we'll see how many other teams only have one as well. And I think the other thing you have to look at with Defiance this year is the fact that they don't really have a home field. They're going to be a little bit of nomads. I think eventually that's going to wear down on them. I think it also helps them too. Okay, so we disagree. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because there have been tra they've been road warriors. And they're playing at Defiance College. A lot of their home games are at Defiance College. Which yep, they were supposed to play Bath at Bowling Green the other yeah. night, and they ended up moving that to D.C. And right. You know, I just, you know, getting that little road experience isn't necessarily a bad thing come tournament time either. Another thing that high school teams have been dealing with is the weather. We seem to be past the terrible stretch that we went through, but it is condensing the baseball season. So with that in mind, do you think we could have a, a fluky league champion in, in, one of our, in one of our leagues? Well, I think somebody's going to have an advantage over somebody else just because of the way the schedule works out. I, I don't have the schedule memorized, but you know, well, like it Bath changes this almost week, every day too. Yeah. Right. Bath is playing four straight days this yeah. week. Right. So, you know, I think it may add more flukiness to it. It's, you know, spring sports are always subject to the weather changes and the schedule getting all messed up. So one thing's for sure, you want to have a deep pitching staff and you don't want it to run out on that day of a big league game, which can happen if things go wrong for you. Yeah, it's going to come down to that fifth or sixth pitcher on somebody's staff, maybe a, a freshman or a sophomore. They bring up maybe to do a spot start or bring it in relief and, you never know how that type of kid's going to react. I think we are going to have some head-scratching results in the spring sports this season. Yeah, I think you look at softball and track as well as some of these where, granted, the track are more individual, but softball being the more team, you might see a team, you know, sneak up that, you know, might be able to knock off, say, a Shawnee or a Bath, just using those because those are teams that have been pretty good around here the last few years. Or, you know, a team like 
you know, perhaps an Allen East, somebody like that in the Northwest Conference that maybe gets a jump on somebody as well. On any given day, something could happen, but especially with the schedules being as fluctuant as they've been this year. League titles are definitely important, but of course, I think the postseason and how far you go in the tournament carries more weight. Now, the tournament's not too far away. It's actually right around the corner. If you're Draws a May 1st. Right. If you're a coach of these teams, which are, which are you focused more on? Are you going to give more credence to a league game or a tournament game? Well, you know, we do have those situations sometimes where they intermingle. Right. You know, I think until it gets to that point, you don't really have to pick and choose which is more important. But if it does come down to that, I think you have to play for the postseason because that ultimately is the, the bigger prize. But the, the other thing that is interesting, such as Bath this week playing four straight days, one of those is a non-league game. You almost are throwing the game away because there's no way you can throw any of your top shelf pitchers in a non-league game when the next day you have a league game. You just can't do it. So you could see some upsets in some non-league games in those situations because Teams just simply won't throw their better pitchers. And a lot, you mentioned the crossover of the tournament and the uh, regular season. A lot of schools will set their pitching up to more so worry about the tournament, whereas that non league right. game, as you mentioned, might see, you know, that fifth or sixth guy that really hasn't pitched a lot of innings go out. And if we win, we win. If we lose, it's okay. We're still living to fight another day because we've made it to districts already, for an example. All right, let's move to the NFL now, guys. Next Thursday is the first round of the NFL draft. The Browns were scheduled to pick second, but they have traded that pick to the Eagles. What's your take on this move? Did they finally do something right? Maybe that's the question. Well, it's funny because Mark tweeted out almost simultaneously, can we trust these guys? And I guess the answer is we don't know. It's a, another new regime that gets another chance. This time here. it'll be different. Well, we promise. <laughs> it, I, you know, on, on its surface, it looks like a good deal. You know, maybe you got to believe their thinking is they're the quarterback they really wanted. Perhaps they figure the Rams are going to take him. So now let's see if we can stock up some picks. I think they got a lot for that pick moving down just six notches. With all things being equal, I say this is a winner. Now, of course, it's the Browns, so it could all blow up in their face. But on first blush, I got to like it. Including the number eight overall pick that they got right. from Philly. They got five picks out of this deal, including a one next, next year, year, which I think is, was, a, was the best part of this pickup. And they only had to give up two picks, including that number two. So on the surface, it looks like the Browns made out. However, it's the Browns we're talking about. If somebody can mess it up, it's the Browns. Overcook rice, it's the Browns. Burn a steak, it's the Browns. They would have been smart enough to draft Jerry Rice to overcook him. <laughs> yeah, guys, well nice. played there, my man. Well played indeed. You look at what they have now. I think they've got, what, six picks in the top 100 yes. of this year's draft. And clearly, the Cleveland Browns have a lot of holes they need to fill. So you've got six picks in the top 100. Perhaps that is the first start to getting those holes filled. But again, it, it comes down to whether or not you're going to trust this new regime to make wise selections, something that no Browns regime has really done since they have come back to the NFL in 1999. And consider this, guys. I saw one mock draft that's got Joey Boza slipping to number eight in the Browns for that number eight pick. Yeah, you know, the, the other thing to consider here is all these picks are great, but I think a lot of how these picks work out and how the Browns work out is how good RG3 can be. Mm -hmm. If he can come back and be an average or above average NFL quarterback, give them some stability, some actual competence at quarterback, all these other picks will fit in better and things will be better. If he's a complete bust, it's going to fall apart again. And quickly, yeah. Well, it's interesting that RG3 is now in Cleveland given, you know, remember a couple of years ago, Lucker, RG3, that was the big debate. Right. Now he's with the Browns and seeking redemption himself could be, could be beneficial for the Browns. In the NBA, round one of the postseason continues. The Cavs and the Pistons will play game two Wednesday. Are you worried about Cleveland? They really only had three scores in game one, but that's all they need, right? They had 81 of their 106 come from Love, Irving, and, and LeBron. I'm, I'm not worried per se, but the Pistons gave them everything, including the kitchen sink, and it still wasn't enough. I think, the, I think maybe five games this series. I'll tell you, I was, I was encouraged by the fact the big three scored 81 mm -hmm. points. You know, it's about time they put something together. I thought it was a good sign, uh, the game one, that the Pistons tested. They made a bunch of threes. which 15. You know, 
Yeah, you don't figure they're going to shoot over 50% from long range the whole series. The Cavs made a slight adjustment in their lineup fourth quarter, went small, which they're going to need to do if they get to Golden State in the finals. Uh, I, I thought it was a good development. I, I don't think the Pistons have enough to really challenge them. But I, for the big picture, I did like what I saw in game one. I like the fact that LeBron kind of coasted. He had 11 assists, finished with right around 20 points. 22. We, yeah, 22. We didn't see LeBron dominate the game because he didn't need to. And if you can save some wear and tear on LeBron in the first couple rounds yeah. of, the, of the postseason for the Cavs, more power, too. Yeah. I, I'm not yeah. concerned. Yeah. We talked about it two weeks ago when we did the show about the tread on those tires of his. That's a prime example, as you just mentioned, of you know resting him without – having him overexert, so to speak, in game type situations. Plus, I, I maintain this Cavaliers team is better if LeBron is not leading them in scoring. I think if he can be the distributor, he can make things happen, and guys like Irving and Love go off and score more, they're going to be a better team. When the offense runs and it's only LeBron, that's when they struggle. When he's out front with the stanky leg trying to make plays, they struggle. If it flows like that, he's got 11 assists and 20 to 25 points. Irving and Love are playing better, feeling good. This team could be dangerous. The fact that Stan Van Gundy had to resort to complaining about the officiating tells me the Pistons mentally aren't going to there. Yeah. They're not there. Cavs are playing the long game, and it almost feels like they're the Spurs, where they're not, not going to rest LeBron, but they'll play smarter against the Pistons and in this first round and, and prepare for hopefully four series and, and the finals. In the, in the Major League Baseball, we're now a couple weeks into the season. Have we learned anything? Can we learn anything this early on? A couple teams started 0-9. Everybody's got wins. Everybody's got losses. We, we know who's in first, but it doesn't really matter right now, does it? There's been a nice story out of Colorado. Yeah. Well, he kind of had a short story and has come back to earth. The guy that I've been most impressed with, absolutely without a doubt, Bryce Harper is the real deal. Last year was not a fluke. When you start putting your name up with guys like Mel Ott and, and Hank Aaron and, and Rodriguez in terms of the quickest to 100 home runs and things like that, Bryce Harper off to a fantastic start to this year. Yeah, no question about it. I'd say as far as our teams are concerned, the Indians and Reds, uh, I think it's uh, the Indians are still holding out hope that when they get guys back, they can get some offense to, to pick them up. But the one thing I have liked about the Reds is it seems like there's just a better energy about the team. Last year it was almost like we were waiting for the other shoe to drop. When are they going to trade Cueto? When are they going to trade Leak? This year a lot of youth – a lot of youngsters playing, it seems to have energized things a little bit, although we certainly don't plan on them being in the playoffs. But you're seeing things like Robert Stevenson getting a look here and there and some of the younger guys. I think it's kind of fun to watch. What do you make of Stevenson going back down to AAA? Is that all just about service time and trying to keep his salary as low as possible for as long as possible? Well, I don't think it's about keeping his salary low. It's about control. If uh, Chris Walsh made a great point with me on WIMA Wednesday. If they had done this with Johnny Cueto and Mike Leake, they'd be with the Reds this year still. This is all about managing when he's a free agent. That's all it's about because if he's as good as they think he can be, once he is a free agent, they'll have to let him go. So if you can keep him in the minor leagues for a good part of this year and a season you don't think is going to be any good anyway, you do it. Reds have definitely been competitive so far, which is more than I thought was going to happen. Quick point on Bryce Harper. Isn't it interesting that Trout and Harper came out together, right? Mm -hmm. Trout kind of leaped ahead, and we were like, wow, Trout is the best thing that we've seen in a long time. His numbers were incredible. Harper's catching up, and right now I would say they're back to neck and neck again, and Harper's primed to maybe surpass Trout if this were a horse race. I, I wonder if it's a little bit of an East Coast, West Coast thing, because we didn't get to see Trout as much, because he's out on the West Coast, so you only – heard about him. Maybe you saw some clips with Harper being in the East Coast and there's much more media intensity in Washington, D.C. than there is in Anaheim and certainly the Papelbon incident last year. There's a lot of people that were prejudiced against Bryce Harper from the get-go just because of the way he kind of jobbed the system and went out and graduated early from high school so he could be drafted early and was homeschooled and all that type of stuff. I think there's some people who were coming into the, the season back in 2012 we're already prejudiced against Bryce Harper, and I think that's what we're seeing is people are starting to let that go to the wayside. Well, yeah, they were prejudiced against Bryce Harper because he's a jerk. But eventually, jerk or not, he's a great player. Yes. I think he's. I think Trout's got a better head on his shoulders. That could be better for the long run. But, I mean, I'll take either one of them if yeah. you want to put him on my team. Two pretty special players. All right, great job, guys. Thanks again. That does it for this week's Press Row. Enjoy your spring sports action this weekend, and we'll see you next week.